responsibility to make sure we're tracking that aircraft at all times. We have to know, God forbid, if something happens that we can find that aircraft at any given time. We have a computerized tracking system that automatically tracks the aircraft. Now, we can't always rely on that 100 percent because, as we know, technology does fail. So we also have our comp specs trained in finding that aircraft by hand. So we're on top of those maps knowing where they're at at any given point. That's our primary responsibility. Once that aircraft is airborne, that is our main focus. We make sure everything is done safe at all times and for the safety of not only our crew but the people on the ground and the patient because it does nothing to get there or to get back if you can't do it safely. After they lift from the uh, scene and they're en route back to the hospitals, we put the team in contact with the physicians so they can give report. Everybody's on the same page. So when they land, they have everybody ready to play. There are times you're making 20 to 30 phone calls per minute or per flight, you know, to make sure everybody's on the same page. Something's changing. The 911 center calls and says, hey, we're changing the landing zone. That can happen two or three times. Uh, we can get out there and say, we're not comfortable landing where we are at. Now we're getting back on the horn. Hey, we're changing landing zones. The aircraft's calling us. We're making sure where everybody is on the same page. Um, you know, so safety is of the utmost importance. Not only that, but we go to, we're not the only helicopter program in town. And with that, throws another safety feature out there. Are we the only aircraft responding to this accident if it's a scene flight? And if we're not, we have to know who is responding with us and that we're talking to each other not only on the phone but in the air. It's like anything. If communication doesn't start and, and happens effectively, lines get crossed. And you want to make sure that if those lines do get crossed, everybody's on the same page. So when, when we arrive at an accident scene, um, usually we know the, the people, the EMS providers that are there. I may not remember everyone's name, but usually I re recognize a face, or maybe it's someone that I used to work with at Union Township, which I love showing up someplace where I know the people's names and I know the, the great quality of care that they got. I can, sometimes I can say, all right, we're going to Union Township. They're, they're a high-performing paramedic level ambulance. I know that they're gonna have the maximum done on this patient. Um, so when we really, as we're coming in, we start to build a rapport with the ground units via the radio. So we communicate with them on the radio when we're a few miles away from landing. And the, the big part of the information that we want to get is some safety information about the landing zone, where it is, are there any obstructions. But then we also want to try to get a patient report. What happened to the patient? Because sometimes when we're called out, we don't even know what, what happened. You know, we're, we're told, you know, you're going out to Union Township, Claremont County for a person injured. Okay, well, how were they injured? You know, is it a gunshot wound? Is it a car crash? You know, was someone falling off a horse? So we try to get that information from the radio, and that's when we really start to build that, that initial rapport for that scene, is to say, okay, this is what you're coming for. This is what we've done, all right? Um, and, and that just kind of starts the transfer of care. When we land, uh, typically as we're starting to walk towards the patient with our, our gear, whether it just be our bags or if we take our stretcher with us also, someone, one of the EMS or fire uh, department folks will come up to us and start giving us a report, which is great. They'll just say, hey, this is, this is a guy, he was, he was not wearing a seatbelt, he was driving his car, and they're helping to breathe for him right now in the back of the ambulance, which gets us thinking, all right, we need to, it gets my mind thinking, all right, what do we need to do once we get in the back of the ambulance? What do we need to assess? What kind of treatment do we need to, to have? Um, and it also lets me potentially get on the radio to my pilot and say, you know what, we want to leave the helicopter running so that we can get out of here a little bit quicker. But then once we get into the ambulance, we, we have a routine where the, the flight nurse, like myself, always goes in the back door of the ambulance. And the flight physician always goes into the side door of the ambulance where they're closer to the patient's head. Uh, once we both get in there, then we get a, a more thorough report from the medical crew in the ambulance. Some of the places we go uh, just have basic EMTs or first responders, which is kind of the, the lowest tier of, of EMS. Um, in some places that we go, we have paramedic level. And so the report that we get will often vary as far as the information that they have based on their education level. Um, but the expectation, whether, it's, it's, whether we're working with paramedics at an accident scene or at another hospital, is that once air care shows up, they take control of the patient. Um, now, taking control doesn't mean that everyone else leaves because we often still need a lot of help. And we, we love our, our EMS folks because they are so good at working with us. 
in getting this patient what we call packaged and ready for transport. Um, sometimes that involves a lot. Sometimes we have to start out of these, give medications, put breathing tubes in, decompress pneumothoraxes and things of that nature, and we require a lot of help because for us on air care, we're just two people, which works out great when we're in the back of the helicopter. It's very small. There's not room for more people. So we try to get the patient a little more stabilized in the ambulance, and so we, we really need the help. And I tell you, I have never had a, a bad interaction with an EMS person on the, on the scene because I think they're, they're used to working in high acuity situations. We're used to it. We come to the table together, and our goal is to get the job done. And, you know, there's not a, you know, if, it's a, if things are relaxed and the patient's pretty stable, they're, you know, we may share some nice word, words about working together in the past or something like that. But our goal is to get this, this patient out of there and stabilized as quickly as we can. And uh, I tell you, we have, we have great teamwork around here. It's really wonderful. We obviously have initiated care. We have obviously made a decision that we believe that, that, that air care is a benefit, um, not only the expedient transport to a hospital for whatever reason, but also that they're going to bring something to this patient's care that is in the best interest of the patient. At the same time, we've obviously spent some time with the patient. We've initiated care. We may have um, started some IVs, done some airway techniques, did some interventions before they get there. We also have the advantage that um, we probably know more about the mechanism of injury. They're not going to know that when they get to the scene. So they're relying on us to say, um, this person was whether it be a gunshot wound or shot or whatever in, in, at close range and this is the caliber of the gun or they were in an auto accident and they were the driver and they were unrestrained and they hit a tree and they have damage on the driver's side. Um, especially if we're not landing them at the scene, they can't see that and that's all important information. So then we, there's this transfer of information and transfer of care. And there's a short, there's a short time period in the back of that ambulance where it's all hands on deck that we have the paramedics are all in there, you know, putting monitors on, starting IVs, giving medications, doing airway, airway techniques. You got the doctor, you got the flight nurse who are, are highly skilled and highly trained in what they do. That's what they do. Um, they, they bring an, a level of expertise and training and equipment that you can't get anyplace else in the pre-hospital setting. Everybody's busy and then that transfer of care goes from primarily being us when we start to, to turning it over to them, and then we assist them in packaging that patient, um, transferring them over to their cardiac monitor, their IV pumps, whatever it is they're doing, and then ultimately loading them in the helicopter where they take over total care and transport them to the, um, to the receiving hospital. But th the teamwork is just phenomenal. I mean, these are, these are highly trained on both sides, skilled, um, dedicated medical staff, that are ultimately looking at what is in the best care of this patient. On this day, at this time, how can we provide the best service possible to this? And everybody's focused on that. Follow-up, they take it down. We usually receive a phone call after them. We'll, we'll have a follow-up letter from them. It doesn't end there because, you know, obviously we're interested and the paramedics are interested. What happened? What was the outcome? Um, what can we learn from this? What can we do better the next time? What can be done differently? And they're very involved in the education of the pre-hospital people. They put on conferences, do continuing ed, they have online continuing ed. So it, it's again, it's just a total team approach that everybody's in it to provide on any given day at that specific time, how can we best provide that care to this patient for the best possible outcome? 911, what's the address of the emergency? Uh, the address is the, um, the Goodwill. It's, um, it's on Beachmont. Well, we received the first call to the communication center at 1347. Uh, he's been injured. He's been hit by an automobile. We actually arrived on the scene at 1350 hours, so shortly after we received the call, within about three minutes. Well, we already had some notification in route that this had the potential to be a serious run for us. So when they arrived on the scene, they found a pickup truck uh, up against the wall and uh, they found one victim there that had very serious injuries to his lower extremities. Well, one of the first things they want to do is, is do a quick evaluation. They did that and then start to stabilize. And in this case, there was serious bleeding. So one of the first things they need to do is, is start to be concerned about the bleeding. And, and they work to control that. And the officer 